Why was Jesus forsaken by God on the cross? Jesus, while he was being crucified, cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The meaning of this statement is often controversial. While there is controversy around this question, one thing that we can know for sure is that Jesus didn't utter this statement so that it would cause confusion. If we'll just take a step back for a minute and look at what the scriptures actually say, we can know much about why Jesus was forsaken by God on the cross. Matthew 27, 46, and in Mark 15, 34, we read the words that Jesus uttered, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I have heard it incorrectly asserted that Jesus was confused, or perhaps he was even having a crisis of faith, that he was crying out and genuinely asking this. However, if we'll just read the Gospels in their entirety, this is completely incompatible with everything that we know about who Jesus is and was. Jesus was well aware of why he was being crucified. Jesus is actually quoting the first part of Psalm 22. If you read Psalm 22 in its entirety, you'll see that the psalmist, after asking this question about being forsaken, actually expresses much hope that his forsakenness will not last forever. Some, when they read this psalm in its context, conclude that Jesus wasn't actually forsaken because of that hopeful turn that this psalm takes. However, I don't think that that's the best conclusion to draw. It doesn't say, my God, my God, why does it appear that you have forsaken me even though you actually haven't? Although some object to it, the text affirms, as Jesus quotes this passage, that he was being forsaken. And so the question isn't, was he, but why was he? Differing assumptions lead to different ideas of what this phrase, being forsaken by God, actually means. And that's where a lot of the controversy or disagreement is. We'll get to that more in just a moment. But for now, why don't we just take a step back and look at what's happening on the surface as this is unfolding in the gospel stories. Jesus quotes directly from Psalm 22, verse 1. Specifically, he quotes the first half of this verse. And so understanding what's going on, we can see fairly clearly that Jesus isn't asking a question, but instead he is announcing or declaring truth to those onlookers because of the questions that they are asking. In the historical context, they are misunderstanding the events as they're unfolding, and Jesus is using this opportunity to explain to those onlookers, and then for us as well as we read these gospel accounts, what exactly is happening so that we can put our faith and trust in him. Immediately before Jesus cries out with this statement, we see that he is being mocked and ridiculed. And Mark records, Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the mockers were looking at Jesus upon the cross, they were stating their position of how they thought God should act if Jesus were truly who he claimed to be, if he really was the promised Messiah who was to come into the world. They thought that if Jesus was actually the Messiah, that God would intervene, that he would rescue his servant. Jesus was quoting from Psalm 22, a prophetic messianic psalm written about a thousand years before the events happening that we read about in the Gospels to answer those direct questions explaining why it was that their assertions were false. It was incorrect of them to assume that if he was the Messiah, he would rescue himself, because in fact, Jesus didn't come to save himself, but to save others. Similar truth was recorded by the prophet Isaiah about 700 years before this uh, crucifixion actually took place, when the prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 53, verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Jesus was being forsaken by the Father to die. He was forsaken physically. He would not come down from the cross and rescue himself because he came into Jerusalem to lay down his life so that he could take it up again on the third day. 
For everyone who was looking, saying, Behold the man upon the cross. Behold the man dying under the curse of God. If he is who he claimed to be, he would come down from there. Jesus quotes Psalm 22 to say, No, I will be forsaken to die on this cross because this is my purpose, not for my salvation, but for the salvation of others. This being forsaken unto physical death on the cross is something that hopefully all Christians can agree upon. We should all agree that the Father did not rescue his Son from dying on the cross. We can all agree this was not because God was unable or because Jesus was unworthy. This did not prove what the mockers claimed. In fact, it proved the opposite. When we move beyond the surface level, beyond the physical and the visible, that's when the controversy really begins. Often the question is framed the same, but really it's a different question that's being asked. The surface question is what we began with. Why? Why was Jesus forsaken to die on the cross? Was it because he was a blasphemer and a sinner and God was displeased with him? Well, we've answered that directly. No, it was actually the opposite. The secondary question isn't why, but it's really what or how. What was the nature of this being forsaken and how could this be? Are there deeper spiritual realities beyond this abandonment on the cross? Was Jesus forsaken spiritually in addition to physically by the Father on the cross? To try and offer an answer to these related questions, we need to do a little bit more speculation, or at least we need to try and do some more systematic theology of piecing various passages together. And because not all Christians share the same assumptions and our systems are a little bit different, not everyone agrees how we bring these various passages together. I understand in the midst of this conversation that some genuine believers come to very different conclusions than I do. And that's okay with me. I hope it's okay with you too. As Christians, it should be enough for us to believe that without, without always having to know exactly how. A similar or related analogy is you can know that your car can take you places even if you don't know exactly how the internal combustion engine works. Your ability to know that your car works doesn't necessarily depend or hinge upon your understanding of how all of the intricacies work together to make that a reality. Likewise, Christians can believe that Jesus died for our sins. We can believe that he made atonement for us without necessarily agreeing on every little detail and nuance of how that salvation was made possible. The salvation that Jesus purchased for all who trust in him works whether we fully understand it or not. It's not built upon our understanding, but upon the person of Christ who overcame on behalf of his people. Now, I am persuaded as I read the scriptures that Jesus was not just bearing the wrath of the Romans on the cross, and he wasn't just bearing the wrath of the Jews on the cross, but he was bearing the wrath of God the Father as he died upon the cross. I believe that that is the best understanding of how all of the verses in scripture come together to show us how it is that Jesus rescued us from our plight as sinners. I also understand that there are genuine believers who disagree with those conclusions, and they would say, well, there isn't actually a verse anywhere in the Bible that says, says explicitly, Jesus died under the wrath of the Father on the cross, and I'll acknowledge that. And there are others who say that the implications of that teaching would cause various difficulties, particularly within the Trinitarian working of who God is. If the Father forsook his Son spiritually upon the cross, the claim is that this would cause some sort of disruption in the triune nature of God that can't be. While I've heard these objections, I just need to state that I disagree with them. My understanding of the scriptures as I read them is different. As we look at what the scriptures do say explicitly, I think it's good for us to start there. For example, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This passage explicitly states that he, the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin. On the cross, Jesus became sin. That's a significant and weighty statement. And all throughout scripture, we see the disposition of a holy, righteous, and just God toward sin. It's a position that is filled with wrath. So therefore, to me, it doesn't seem like some risky theological jump to say that the Father poured out his wrath upon the Son on the cross because that is how God deals with sin throughout the scriptures. Likewise, the Apostle Paul declared in Romans chapter 8, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and other passages that speak of the Messiah's 
ministry of coming to bear the sin of the world in his flesh, we see that he became sin. He took upon himself the fullness of the penalty. Now, what does the scripture say that the penalty for sin is? Well, the wages of sin is death. But is that all? The scriptures also tell us that we await a savior from heaven who rescues us from the wrath that is to come. All throughout the Bible, death is not just a biological truth. It is also a spiritual truth. We see that those who are separate from Christ, outside of Christ, are spiritually dead even while they are biologically alive. And the testimony of Scripture is that those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, those who have not been reconciled to the Father through faith in Christ, they are currently under the wrath of God and storing up wrath for themselves on the day when God's righteous wrath is revealed. When we add all of these things together, that's not the only testimony of Scripture. Both Matthew and Mark's gospel record that while Jesus was dying on the cross, that darkness came over the land for a three-hour period. As we continue to read the passage, we read, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The wrath of the Jews didn't cause the earth to go dark. Neither did the wrath of the Romans. And yet, as we read through the scriptures, we see a number of passages that associate darkness and the sky going dark, the sun no longer giving its light, associating that with the wrath and judgment of God. In addition to that, we can ask the question, what would cause the earth to shake and the rocks to be split? Does the scripture give us a description of what would do just that? Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. As Jesus hung upon the cross, as he became sin and bore the sin of the world in his flesh, he did what no one else could do. He stood before the burning wrath and indignation of God the Father. As the prophet Nahum records the terrifying, awesome presence of God and his wrath of what it does to the whole earth, those rhetorical questions should lead us to believe that no one could possibly stand. No one, that is, except for the Messiah. Jesus, the God-man, became a man for this purpose, to lay down his life as a sacrifice for the sin of the world, so that all who believe upon him could know that he is able to save them from the wrath that is to come. As Jesus died on the cross, being forsaken unto death, he was even spiritually forsaken by the Father, becoming sin and having all of the wrath of God be poured out upon him, which caused the sky to go dark. And after Jesus yielded up his spirit and the wrath of God was dissipating, we saw that it caused the earth to shake and the rocks to be broken up. The people who would be most aware of what these phenomena meant were the Jews who were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, which is why Matthew records this detail. For those who understood the Old Testament, that God's wrath was being poured out upon Jesus, and now it was finished. While I understand that some object to this teaching, the reality is, is that the scriptures testify that Jesus came to be a savior, to save us from sin, death, and wrath. Jesus became a man in the likeness of sinful flesh, although he himself knew no sin. And then according to the predetermined plan of God, he laid down his life, becoming sin and bearing the fullness of the wrath of God, dying, being forsaken of the Father, so that he could rise again in victory on the third day over all of it. So that we who look to this Savior could put our complete trust in him, knowing that he is capable and able to overcome when no one else could. So, why was Jesus forsaken by God on the cross? The most straightforward answer is so that we who trust in him could know that our sins are truly forgiven because he was forsaken unto death and then he overcame on the third day, demonstrating with power that he alone has authority on earth to forgive sins and to grant remission of sins and reconciliation to the Father to all who trust in him. Turn to him, all you ends of the earth. Put your faith in Jesus. Be reconciled to God. If you want to talk more about this, leave your comments below. We have an article as well, which I'll link in the description box. But until next time, get equipped, obey your king, and glorify your God. Understanding. Stop hitting the microphone.